This morning I want to be discussing prophecy, a little bit of a prophecy update. But before I do, I just wanted to kind of remind everybody here, maybe anybody online, about what it is Riverside believes in the way of eschatology. Eschatology, big sounding word, simply means uh, the study of what the Bible says is going to happen in the end times. So here's the Riverside Calvary Chapel digest version. Ready? We hold to a pre-tribulation rapture, followed by a seven-year great tribulation period, followed by the second coming of Jesus Christ, and then finally, a literal thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ on earth called the Millennial Kingdom. You guys tracking with that? You know, a lot of people in Christianity no longer or don't believe in a lot of that, so we're, I think we're about 20% who believe in that um, understanding of end times events. So we're kind of a minority in a way. <clears throat> we also believe that what God's word teaches um, is that not only do we hold to that eschatology, but we also uh, understand that other people have different views, and so that's fine. They can have them. I personally think they're <clears throat> not correct, but I could be wrong. Uh, we also believe that God is not done with Israel and the Jewish people. And we as a church stand with Israel. Amen? Amen? Now, I'm going to start with this. And this may lift a few eyebrows of those who love prophecy. What if I can narrow down the exact date of when the rapture will occur? What would you think about that? <laughs> well, at least I won't be struck down in the pulpit. At least... But what if I could? What if I could accurately predict the timing of the rapture? And let's say I picked a date, Monday, May 14th, 2018, exactly 70 years after Israel was reborn. And if I could prove to you beyond a shadow of a doubt that that is when the Lord would come for his church, if I could prove that to you, I ask you this question. How would you live out those remaining four and a half months that we would have left? Would you live it up and max out your credit cards? Or would you get your affairs in order? Or would you begin sharing the gospel with a confidence and boldness like never before? Or would you say, four and a half months, that's lots of time. I'll share the gospel when I get around to it. The truth is this, and the reality is this, we should live every day like this is the last day, that we don't have another day, because we don't know for sure. Rapture can happen at any moment. I'm hoping for right at this moment, but whatever. Um, and there's a truth. A very wise man once said, as recorded for us in the book of Matthew chapter 24, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of Son of Man be. I believe Jesus said this in reference to the first of his second comings. And what do I mean by that? Well, in his second coming, he comes first for his church. That's the rapture, Right? And in the second coming, you can pretty much do the math and know when he's going to return because we know the length of the period of the tribulation period. So I believe he's talking about when you cannot know the day or hour, that is in reference to the rapture. So no one's going to know that day or hour. Yet so many people have tried to predict a date. We just had one back in September, right? What was it, September 23rd, where a lot of people were convinced, oh, man, everything's lining up in the whole thing going on. I don't remember it all. But um, and there was people within this fellowship that really were convinced that this was going to happen. I ask you this question, how often have they been wrong, date setters? 100% of the time, they've been wrong, right? Because we can't know the day or hour. Jesus made it very clear to us. But he said we can recognize the season that we're in. So Jesus is coming soon. All of the signs he's given us kind of point to it. And um, soon he will return. And I will not be predicting a date this morning. I was just kind of messing with your heads initially, just hoping to give you some food for thought. That we should live our lives like he could come today. And I think a lot of well-meaning people set dates. I mean, people that have done it for different reasons. Jehovah's Witnesses do it for whatever reason. They've done so many, I can't believe they even still try. I think they changed it and said Jesus did come, but whatever. They're just wrong. Um, I'm not going to suggest a date because my Savior, my Lord, and King said no one knows the day or hour. But I do get why people do it. 
um, you know, people get so just, um, they look at this world, they see it spiraling into like this moral abyss. They see all the things that are going on. They just want the Lord to come. And I want the Lord to come too. I'd love for him to snatch us away. But we all know that date setting is not scriptural. But there's another reason why people are still setting dates, and that is that Satan himself knows Bible prophecy. And he's seeing what we're seeing, and he knows that Jesus is coming soon. But Satan doesn't want anyone to believe in the Lord's soon return. So he's going to do everything possible to try and discredit God's prophetic word. And one ingenious technique he seems to love to use is to motivate very sincere people to set those dates for the day of Jesus' return. And why would Satan do that? Why would he motivate people to set dates? If he doesn't want people to believe that Jesus is coming soon, it's simple because he knows the dates will prove to be false, just as Jesus said. Satan also knows that the media loves date setters. They focus their cameras and microphones on the date setter, and they let him hang himself with whatever date he comes up with. And when that date comes and goes, the media then laugh and scoff and do their best to paint Christians as a bunch of fools. Trouble is, sadly, a lot of Christians... Because of these date setters, um, they grow apathetic towards end times events and the Lord's return. They lose interest in prophecy and they just kind of tune it out as something completely unknowable and a waste of their time. If that's you you here today, I I just hope that you'll at least listen because what I do know and, and will show you in God's word today is that we are in the general season of his return. And if you turn tune out this message, you're only going to feed Satan's ego, which nobody really wants to do. Now, all that to say this, church, I think we are living in the most exciting times in history to be alive. Don't you agree? We're witnessing Bible prophecy being fulfilled before our very eyes, and it seems to be happening, it's happening like weekly, daily. It's crazy how fast things are starting to progress. And much of what we're seeing in the way of prophecies, obviously they relate to the Jewish people and their nation Israel, but we also see so many world events that are being fulfilled faster than we can keep track. One world government, one world religion, one world economy, technology, they're all progressing at a crazy pace. Artificial intelligence is progressing at a pace that's really kind of scary, what they can do with artificial intelligence. There's a Google executive that wants to create an AI religion and call the church Way of the Future. And it will have its own gospel called the Manual with public worship ceremonies. And he wants to worship artificial intelligence as God which just shows you that even these people desire to worship something. There's now a word that's being used to describe much of what we're seeing in this world, and that word is unprecedented. We've seen this year many unprecedented natural disasters. There was a, I think it was one of the hurricanes that was actually being recorded, um, how they measure earthquakes. Like it was so strong and powerful that they were picking it up on the, um, I don't remember what they call that thing. But, sorry? Yeah, seismograph. It was so big and massive. Uh, Just so many things going on. Wildfires. There's all kinds of stuff that's been happening. And a lot of it is unprecedented. But there's also been unprecedented um, biblically biblically prophetic events that relate to Israel, Jerusalem, and the Jewish people. So what I want to do this morning is focus on God's Word. See what it says about the days ahead. But I want to avoid being um, sensational because you can get caught up in all. There's so much going on. You can get caught up in all kinds of stuff. I want to kind of just stick to God's Word. And so I'm going to give a brief summary this morning of prophecies concerning the Jews and their nation that have been fulfilled in recent history or are currently being fulfilled. And I want to do this just so we have a baseline to establish the accuracy of God's prophetic Word before we look at prophecies that haven't yet been fulfilled. So I'm just going to take a quick look at a few. And the first one I'm going to look at is the Jewish people being regathered in unbelief from the four corners of the earth. Now, I know you guys are all aware of this, but I just want to go through it quick and just establish that baseline. It says in Isaiah 11, It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left, from Assyria and Egypt, from Pathros and Cush, from Elam and Shinar, from Hamath and the islands of the sea. He will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and to gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Now, we know that throughout history of Israel, the Jewish people have been conquered, sent into exile on several different occasions. They've also left Israel for many other reasons. After the stoning of Stephen in the New Testament and the persecution at the hands of the Romans, the Jews were dispersed all over the world. 
For almost 2,000 years, they had no homeland, and they've been living all throughout the world, holding on to their heritage. And that in itself is a miracle, is it not? There's been no other ethnic people group in all of history that's ever been scattered from their land for 2,000 years, and not only kept their heritage and bloodline, but also their language. This is a term we could use the word, we could use the term unprecedented uh, for this event in all of history. It's never happened before. And this regathering that Isaiah speaks of some 2,700 years ago began in the late 1800s with the Zionist movement and is continuing to this very day. People are still to this day returning to Israel. Jews are returning to Israel. And listen to what Ezekiel 37 says. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. This passage talks about Israel being dispersed without a homeland and without any kind of hope, and that God will bring them back into their land. But I also see this passage speaking of an incredibly horrific time for the Jewish people in recent history. I think you guys probably know what I'm talking about. It's the Holocaust, when six million Jews were slaughtered. We've all seen the pictures in the history books of the open graves of Jewish men and women and children who were slaughtered just because they were Jews. And when I see those photos, you know, it's still shocking just to see how incredibly inhuman humans can be to others. And I think of this passage, but out of this horror that happened to them, our Lord began to do a great work. He began regathering, the regathering of his people back into their land. What Satan meant for evil, God has turned into good as only he can. Church, look at what Ezekiel 37 says in verses 21 and 22. It says, Then say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations, wherever they have gone, and will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land, and I will make them one nation in the land, on the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king over them all. They shall no longer be two nations, nor shall they ever be divided into two kingdoms again. After the Holocaust, God put it on the hearts of the world or the heart of the world, um, and he made them become sympathetic to the Jews. And through that, a homeland was carved out of the Middle East. And they have returned to the land in unbelief, just as the Bible says they would, because the Spirit of God has not yet moved in their lives. Scripture teaches us that after the church is removed from the earth in the rapture, the Holy Spirit will move in a powerful way, and the entire nation of Israel will be saved. Isn't that awesome? But until that time, Israel is back in the land in unbelief. So church, I ask you this question. Are the scriptures accurate? I like that one. Of course. Yes, they're accurate. Just exactly as predicted, these things have come to pass. God said through his prophets that he will reestablish the nation of Israel and he will gather them from all the surrounding nations. Now the useless nations... Sorry, I meant the United Nations try to take credit for what God has done, but God himself made them a nation once again, and it happened just as he said it would. You know, people who were alive in 1948, anybody here born prior to 1948? Oh, sorry, I wasn't. What am I doing? But we have a few, right? Um, this was huge. If you understood Scripture and you knew that they would one day be regathered into their land, when this happened, that was momentous when it comes to knowing that the end time was coming close. And I believe they really began looking up almost 70 years ago. Listen to what Isaiah so perfectly prophesied in chapter 66. He said, Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to give birth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? Is this not amazing that God's word gets fulfilled exactly as it is written? Israel became a nation and was restored to its rightful land in a single day. I talk to a lot of people about the Bible. Uh, a lot of people have doubts. They doubt the Bible's accuracy. They doubt that it's, you can take it literally. So many different things. Most people just don't care about the Bible. But the Bible is always right, and the Bible is always true. And if what the Bible says is going to happen hasn't happened yet, it will, just exactly the way God says it will. The last time I gave a prophecy update was back in January 2013. That's going back a ways. And I spent a lot of time 
taking you guys through what's called the mathematical prophecy, where we saw how the Bible predicted the very year that Israel would become a nation based on years of punishment that God had given to the Jews. And I'm not going to go through that today. It's really long. Don't have time for it. Um, but it just confirms the following statement from the book of Isaiah in chapter 46, where it says, For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done. What's God saying here? Simple. He not only knows the end from the beginning, he declared it. He wrote the script. He's directing every detail. And he has given those who believe in him the outline of things that are not yet done. Do you want to know what's going to happen in the future? Do you know how you can find out what's going to happen in the future? Should you just watch the news? No. The best way is to do what? Open up your Bible. Study it, learn it, know what it says. Now, continuing through recent history, Zechariah also predicted in chapter 8 that the Jews will once again reoccupy the city of Jerusalem. So what did that mean? It says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the land of the east and from the land of the west, and I will bring them back, and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. They shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and righteousness. In 1948, when Israel was, um, the nation of Israel was reborn, the Jewish people were not given control of Jerusalem. There was a battle for it, and on November 30th, 1948, a ceasefire was drawn up where Jerusalem was divided between Israel to the west and Jordan to the east, leaving the old city and the Temple Mount in control of Jordan. Nineteen years later, during the Six-Day War, Israel reunited the city on June 7th, 1967. This was also predicted in that mathematical prophecy, which is really incredibly fascinating. Again, not going to go through it, but um, it's a, just amazing when you really go through God's Word. And I want to come back to the topic of Jerusalem um, in a few minutes because it's a hot prophecy topic lately. I'm sure you guys have been listening to the news. But I want to go back to the regathering of Israel. Just talk a little bit more about that. When Israel became a nation in 1948, the land was desolate. It was void of any trees. It had become a desert. Mark Twain had this to say about his visit to the land. He said, of all the lands there are for dismal scenery, I think Palestine must be the prince. The hills are barren. They are dull of color. They are unpicturesque in shape. The valleys are unsightly deserts fringed with feeble vegetation that has an expression about it of being sorrowful and despondent. Not a very, good, not a very pretty picture of Israel, is it? Or of the land. And it's not a glowing endorsement of the land about to be given back to the Jewish people. The reality is nobody wanted the land. To the world, it was a desolate, worthless chunk of land, but not to God. The Bible predicted that the land of Israel would, would be reclaimed from its desolation, becoming once again a land of agricultural abundance. Listen to what it says in Ezekiel 36. Thus says the Lord God, On the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will also enable you to dwell in the cities, and the ruins shall be rebuilt. The desolate land shall be tilled instead of lying desolate in the sight of all who pass by. So they will say, This land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden, and the wasted, desolate, and ruined cities are now fortified and inhabited. Then the nations which are left all around you shall know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt the ruined places and planted what was desolate, I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. Church, has this prophecy been fulfilled? Anybody been to Israel? If you haven't, go sign up for the trip in March, and you'll see just how this has been fulfilled. Israel is one of the world's leading fresh citrus producers and exporters, including oranges, grapefruit, tangerines. More than 40 types of fruit are grown in Israel. Israel produces vast quantities of flowers for export, in addition to flowers, Favored in the West, such as lilies, roses, tulips, Israel exports numerous desert varieties. It's truly become a major player in the global floral industry. Israel is also a world leader in agricultural research and development, which has led to dramatic increases in the quantity and quality of the country's crops. What a transformation, let alone all the other incredible technologies that Israel's provided. Most of what you guys deal with every day, your phones and all this technology, Israel is the one who's created all this stuff. In Ezekiel 36, do you remember what it said? It said, the nations which are left all around you shall know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt the ruined places, and I planted what was desolate. 
I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. When God regathered his people back into the land, he rebuilt the ruined places. He tilled the desolate ground, and he planted and watered it. The nations that surround Israel saw how God transformed this once desolate land into a land that they were compared to the Garden of Eden. In fact, if you do like an aerial shot, you can literally see incredible lush green, and then right next to it, in the next country, it's just barren. There's nothing. So the Arab people see what um, Israel has become, and they've claimed it as their own land. Now, I've spent a few... I spent some time with these few but very important prophecies to remind you. I want to remind you guys just how accurate and trustworthy the Bible is. That's the foundation of what I want you to get today. Bible prophecy has to pass a test, and it has to pass that test how? What percentage of accuracy? 100%. Is that a fairly high standard? Yeah, I'd say. Um, and it does that. And that's how I want us to look now We've looked at prophecies that have, ha have happened, and now we're going to look at stuff that is yet to be fulfilled. And I want us to understand that we can trust these yet-to-be-unfilled prophecies with the same conviction of their truth as the prophecies we've just talked about. Here's the first one. A northern coalition consisting, consisting mainly of Muslim nations are going to invade Israel. In Ezekiel 38, it says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog, of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. So, church, listen to what it says here. Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. Who is Gog? Anybody want to throw it out? Yeah, uh, but as far as who Gog is, Gog simply means ruler. He's the ruler of a northern nation that's going to come against Israel in the last days. And the nations are Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and they're all lands in the north. Now, if you do an internet search on who these names reflect as far as lands in the north right now in, in the modern map, it gets really confusing because there's a lot of different opinions on who Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal are. Many scholars now generally agree that this is modern-day Russia, but I just want us to keep an open mind as the months and years progress because nobody's really completely sure on this one. Continuing in verse 4, it says, I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and lead you out with all your army, horses, and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Now, these next few names, we can identify it with a little more clarity. In verse 5, it says Persia. We know this is modern-day Iran. Cush, this is northern Ethiopia and Sudan. And Put, modern-day Libya and North Africa. It says, we'll be with them, all with shields and helmets. Also Gomer, with all its troops, and Beth Togarma, from the north, with all its troops, the many nations with you. So this is the coalition that's going to be formed to do battle with Israel. Gomer and Beth Togarma, we know that to be modern day, the modern-day region of Turkey. So we kind of have a list of who's going to be involved in this war. So if we've been listening to the news out of the Middle East the past several years, what are we going to see has happened? Well, we know Russia moved into Syria with the so-called intent to fight the rebels and ISIS and keep Syrian President uh, Bashar al-Assad in power. That's the premise they went in under, to get into Syria. Now, if we fast forward to today, ISIS has been all but defeated by guess who? Trump. He's trumped them. No, sorry. Didn't want to, didn't want to go there. Um, the, he's actually called the accidental president. You know, they, that's what they call him. He's an accident. That he's president is an accident. But when he came into power, he told his military to get it done. Take these guys out, get rid of them. And they've pretty much done that. But the reality is Russia's not leaving the area. Actually, a few weeks ago, there was a news report that Putin had given the order to remove Russian troops from Syria. Anybody hear that one? Well, the reality is he's moving some of the troops out because he has an upcoming election and he wants things to look like, you know, he's done his job and he's got the people back. But the reality is he can have his personnel back there in no time. Russia's not going in anywhere. In fact, many believe that Putin's now controlling what's going on in Syria and he can have his troops deployed back at any, at any moment's notice. Did anybody see the, there was a clip that showed Putin arriving in Syria 
to meet with President uh, Assad. And it shows them on the tarmac, and Putin's walking ahead, and you can see Assad trying to catch up to him, and he's restrained. They don't allow him to get up close to um, President Putin. So that's why they're saying that the reality is Putin is really controlling Syria right now. Um, Russia's interests in Syria include protecting its military bases on the Mediterranean coast. They have a deep water port at Tardis, which offers Russian naval ships and nuclear submarines their only access to the eastern Mediterranean. In fact, I just read an article this week that said Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu said Russia has begun establishing a permanent presence in its military bases in Tardis and Hamimim in Syria. And I also read another article this week where Rear Admiral Andrew Lennon, NATO submarine forces commander, has warned that Putin's submarine activity is at its highest since the Cold War. He also said that NATO had spotted six of the Kremlin's new Kilo-class diesel-electric subs in the Black Sea in the Mediterranean, and that Russia is clearly taking an interest in NATO nations' undersea infrastructure, including U.S. and European data links. They're looking at the cable. There's cabling that runs all under the sea that provides your internet and all this communication stuff. So they've been looking at it now for a while, and um, all they would have to do is sever that, and they would basically destroy a certain countries' economy. So they've, um, they're very busy and very much rooted now in Syria. It also places them in a str very strategic position to attack Israel, as God's word says a nation from the north will do during the tribulation period. They're right up on the, near the Golan Heights, which is right where Israel is. They're right within, they don't even have to have special weapons. They can just walk right in. Now it says that God will place a hook in the jaw of Gog, whoever Gog is. And there's been a lot, of, a lot of speculation as to what will that hook be. It could be oil, it could be natural gas, it could be minerals. We don't know for sure. But whatever it is, God is the one who's going to draw Gog, the leader of this coalition, to attack Israel. Sorry. Now, is, again, is Putin Gog? I can't say for sure, but it, it's kind of fitting the picture right now. But we can't say for sure. We now also have Turkey and Iran who have set up military installations, scientific research labs, and bomb-making facilities all very near the Golan Heights, as well as the city of Damascus. Uh, what does Isaiah 17 say? That the city of Damascus will one day be destroyed and uninhabitable? Has that happened yet? No, but it will. Now, think about this, church. Back in 1978, Iran and Turkey were both allies with Israel. Iran would come to Israel's defense and some of the most common vacation spots for Israelis were in Turkey, where the Jews were more than welcome to come. No one would have imagined Iran or Turkey becoming an enemy of Israel. It just wasn't even thought of in that day. But look what can happen when someone studies the scriptures and believes what they say. Listen to the story. Our beloved pastor Chuck Smith, the man God used to start Calvary Chapel Movement, who's now in heaven, was in Israel after the 1973 Yom Kippur War. The story goes that he was invited to hang out with some Israeli IDF generals up near the Golan Heights. At the time, Iran was under the leadership of the Shah of Iran, and Iran was instrumental in helping Israel win the 1973 war. Very much an ally with Israel. But check this out. Pastor Chuck told those IDF generals that based on what the Bible teaches, Iran would someday become their enemy. The generals, of course, scoffed. They denied that this was even possible. But when it came to pass a few years later, those same generals were calling on Pastor Chuck to see what else the Bible could tell them about the future of Israel. Isn't that incredible? I thought it was incredible. And where is Iran right now? In Syria, near the Golan Heights, literally only a few miles away from Israel, spouting death to America and death to Israel. And Turkey... President Erdogan came to power in, in around 2014, and he's taken Turkey in a very different direction, especially when it comes to Israel. Turkey has aligned itself with Russia and is now part of the Ezekiel Alliance of Nations. So we've got Russia, Iran, and Turkey. Earlier this month, the president of Turkey made this remark. He said in front of hundreds of people following the speech of President Trump on Jerusalem being the capital of Israel, the Turkish president Erdogan claimed, whoever thinks they own Jerusalem knows very well that tomorrow they won't even be able to hide behind trees. And the last part, think about what he just said. They won't be able to hide behind trees. Now, this wording comes out of 
the um, Hadith, which is the oral version of the Quran. And he's referring to the killing of the Jews during the times of Muhammad. This is a, the full part of the text translated into English. It says, Judgment Day will not come into, until you fight and kill them. The Jews are hiding behind stones and trees, but the stones and trees will be called, O Muslim, O servant of Allah, there is a Jew behind me, come and kill him. So did the Tur Turkish sultan cross a red line when he threatened to kill the Jews? I think, I think he did. And I also believe that Turkey, who was once an ally of Israel, is now their enemy. We're literally seeing the Ezekiel 38 coalition being fulfilled before our very eyes. We're seeing it just all starting to form now. Now, what about the other two nations described in Ezekiel? Cush, which is northern Ethiopia and Sudan, and Put, which is modern-day Libya and, and basically North Africa. Well, on November 27th of this year, Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir traveled to Russia stating that his country needs protection from the U.S., and that Sudan could serve as a gateway to Africa from Moscow. Al-Bashir is speaking at the start of his meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin in the Black Sea Resort of Sochi, accused the U.S. of instigating the conflict in Sudan, and Al-Bashir added that we need protection from the U.S. and their aggressive actions. So check, you got one more that's now been added to this coalition. I have a feeling Libya won't be too far behind in joining. So we're seeing Ezekiel 38, this coalition of countries forming together before our very eyes. And it's almost completed. So now, let's move on. Okay, it seems... Um, Zechariah 12, nations of the world will come together against Israel over the issue and control of Jerusalem. It says in Zechariah 12, the burden of the word of the Lord against Israel, thus says the Lord, who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth. Don't you love listening to this stuff? Thus says the Lord, who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. So why is Jerusalem always such a hot button in the world? Because God said, I will make it, make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples. Accidental President Trump who appears to me to be anything but accidental, did, not, did what no other president has done since 1995. In 1995, Congress recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. But they put in place a six-month waiver that each president could waive if he didn't want to make that, didn't want, basically about moving the embassy, if he didn't want to move the embassy, because they're all afraid that this would set off a fire in the Middle East. In a speech, President Trump said, and this just goes, what was, date was this? This was like December 6th. Um, in a speech, President Trump said, and I love, I love the clarity of this and just how straightforward it was. He said, but today we finally acknowledge the obvious. I love that. That Jerusalem is Israel's capital. There is nothing more or less, this is nothing more or less than a recognition of reality. That is so incredible. It's also, it's also the right thing to do, and it's something that has to be done. That's so cool to me. I mean, for so many years, this whole Jerusalem being divided thing uh, to keep the Palestinians happy is just craziness. The reality is that Jerusalem has Jewish roots that go back 3,000 years. It's been their capital since the nation was founded, and the God says it is not to be divided. The Palestinians have no historic link to the city, and in fact, do you guys realize there's no such people in recorded history as, Palestine, as Palestinians? All people who call themselves Palestinians are either Arabs or Egyptians. The name Palestine was created by the Romans to mock the removal of the Jews from their land. And that's just the basic truth. And yet the whole world's been deceived. The Palestinians, as they refer to themselves, have had at least five opportunities in the past, oh, probably close to 70 years, to have their so-called Palestinian state with Jerusalem as either an international city, like it was in 1947, or with East Jerusalem as their capital. Israel has bent over backwards for decades to try and have peace with the Palestinians and the Muslims in general, but it has never happened. The Palestinians have said no to every single proposal. Why? 
Because the Palestinians don't want a two-state solution. They want the Jews annihilated. That's their goal. Now, in light of the refusal of all the previous peace proposals, it's interesting to note the peace proposal that President Trump's advisors are working on. It's much more than just a U.S. creation. It's the product of several months of behind-the-scenes discussions with Israel, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Jordan, and other Arab nations. It's being held as a Trump proposal, but it's actually the creation of many different parties. It's also very interesting that Saudi Arabia and most of the 21 Arab nations said very little when President Trump issued his December 6, 2017 proclamation that Jerusalem is the undivided capital of Israel. It's very interesting that they said very little when the White House said they can't envision the Western Wall on the Temple Mount not being part of Israel. It's also very significant that two Arab nations, Turkey and Jordan, tried to get Saudi Arabia and the other Arab nations to attend an emergency meeting of the 57-member Organization of Islamic Cooperation to vote against President Trump, to try and humiliate him. But the Saudis and others refused to even attend. Another thing to note is that Saudi Arabia and Egypt are very unhappy with Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas because of his ties with the Iranian-backed terrorists in Gaza. Saudi Arabia is very concerned and literally afraid of Iran, and along with Egypt, wants something done about Iran, and they've warned Mr. Abbas to either get on side with the efforts to draft a peace proposal or else. The Saudis in Egypt are obviously interested in drafting with the U.S. and Israel this peace proposal. Now, whether Mr. Abbas will heed the warning and conform to the efforts to draft a peace proposal, this is going to be kind of interesting to watch. Because you know who pays his salary? The Saudis. Pays for his salary and all of his cabinet. So time will tell whether or not he's going to be moved towards accepting this proposal. Another headline from this week, Trump administration to snap ties with Palestinians. No peace plan, no monetary aid. So they're putting a lot of pressure on him to accept this next proposal. And I've been wondering why Saudi Arabia and Egypt, along with Jordan, all of a sudden want to work together with the U.S. on a peace plan. Like, what is the motivation for it? Has anybody heard of the city Niam? Anybody? Okay. Nobody else heard of it? No, it's a city that, I wasn't going to get into it because we don't have time. It's a city that the, the uh, Saudi king, he's 32 years old, he wants to create this incredible city, massive city. It's huge with uh, all new technology. There's going to be a different uh, version of, of Islam. It'll be very moderate. He wants it to be very modern. He wants it to be um, full of technology. Basically, they'll have uh, artificial intelligence all through. It's going to be this incredible city he's got planned. But the crazy part is where it is going to be. It's located right near uh, the Suez Canal. So you got Egypt, you have Israel, you have Jordan. And this is going to be like a hub of commerce. And where Israel kind of fits into the picture is China wants to build a railway, a super fast railway, from uh, where this port would be, where they want to sit up the city, right up through Israel into the Mediterranean. So China wants to build it because they want another quicker way of accessing um, Mediterranean with their products. And what some people are starting to say is this possibly the, the Babylon that is talked about in Revelation. I don't even want to go there. What you should do is if you Google Neom and BRI, you'll get a response that says Saudi Arabia might recognize Israel because of Neom, this new city. And it's a very interesting development. So I don't have time to get into it. Um, you can Google it, but it's crazy what's going on in the world. Now, President Trump clearly intends to release a peace proposal in 2018. And one startling fact is that there is a likelihood that Israel, most of the Arabs, and the Palestinian Authority will come to some kind of an agreement. Now, we know for a fact, because the Bible says, there's never going to be peace. Okay? There just won't be peace until Jesus Christ returns and sets up his kingdom. But I wanted to mention this, because I think it's important. In Daniel 9, verse 27, it says... Then he, speaking of the Antichrist, shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. Now, that can't happen until the church has been removed at the rapture. But sometime shortly after the rapture, a seven-year peace treaty is signed, and the seven-year Great Tribulation period will begin. But this is the part I want you guys to note, that it says in Daniel that he will confirm a covenant. 
which suggests that there is a peace plan in play at the time the Antichrist comes on the scene. But he's the one that confirms it. Could the Trump proposal be that peace plan that the Antichrist confirms? I, I have no idea. I'm just letting you guys know what's going on in the world. But if it is, man, we are getting really close to his return. Couldn't tell you, no idea. Not a clue. Um, there's just so much going on. I gotta wrap this up because we're out of time almost. I wanted to get into this last part and I wanted to kind of share this um, just because it's, there's so much craziness going on. Wars and rumors of wars. North Korea is of great concern to the world right now. They have uh, basically shown their nuclear potential. They're a bit of a crazy nation. Um, we really don't know what's gonna happen, but they're really not in scripture. So I don't even really want to go there with these guys. But Iran, on the other hand, is mentioned in Ezekiel. And perhaps this developing situation is worth mentioning. In 2015, over the objections of Saudi Arabia, Israel and others, the U.S. and others, signed a nuclear deal with Iran that was supposed to stop Iran from obtaining nuclear weapons, limit Iran's missile development, and restrict Iran's sale of certain weapons to other nations. On October 13, 2017, President Trump refused to certify that Iran is keeping their part of the deal. Every president every so often has to certify that they've been keeping their end of it, and he's refused to, uh, to sign that, to certify it. He made a case for attacking Iran and gave Congress 60 days to act before he did anything. Well, that 60 days has passed. Congress hasn't acted, so now it's up to Trump. Iran has shipped weapons, including missiles to Yemen, and built weapons facilities in Lebanon and Syria in violation of their agreement. And Iran has urged jihadists to fire rockets into Israel. In fact, I, I have an app on my phone. Anybody have this app? It's called Red Alert. And it's um, anytime a bomb or a missile is fired at Israel, the alarm goes off. I, Saturday morning at about 4 a.m., I'd left my phone on, the volume on, and it just starts ringing like crazy, basically telling me that there are missiles being fired at Israel. Turns out those two of them were intercepted by the Iron Dome. One of them uh, hit a building, uh, destroyed the building, but nobody was injured. But these missiles were supplied by Iran. So it just confirms what's going on in the world. If you ever, this is a cool app. If you ever want it, just let me know. I'll sell it to you for a thousand bucks. No, you, you can get it online free. Um, but it goes off a lot. You'd be surprised how often they're firing missiles into, into Israel. To live like that must be crazy. All coming out of Gaza right now. So anyway, Israel's refused to pull her troops out of, out of or sorry, Iran has refused to pull her troops out of Syria. They've threatened to send 80,000 Shiite fighters into the Middle East, and Yemen has fired an Iranian missile at Saudi Arabia's public airport, which also got taken out. The next move is now up to President Trump, and some think he'll withdraw the U.S. from the nuclear treaty in January, so that's coming up really quick. But there's going to be a lot of problems with him doing that. So that's something to watch in the new year. Currently, the U.S. and Israel have entered into a secret pact. This just came out the other day um, on how they're going to prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons. They created a, a joint work plan. They're going to come up with some way to stop them. And again, something to watch for the new year. On December 18th, 2017, the same guy, President Trump, released a document that lays out his national security doctrine. It says the Middle East crisis is caused by Iran and radical Islamic terrorists, not Israel. So church, the war drums are beating in the White House, they're beating in Israel, Saudi Arabia, other Arab nations, but I don't believe any of them actually want war. Instead, it's looking like they're trying to find a way to settle their differences and try and sign a peace treaty to reshape the Middle East. So church, when we see scripture like Ezekiel 38 coming to pass before our very eyes, where we're seeing this coalition actually being formed, where Gog and Magog, war players, have all been almost all been aligned. And we have scripture where we see Jerusalem, the capital city of Israel, sparking hatred and anger from surrounding Arab nations. And yet we have Arab nations working with Israel and the U.S. on a peace agreement. You combine that with Matthew 24, which we haven't even touched on, 2 Timothy chapter 3, we have to ask ourselves, are we in the season of his return? Listen to 2 Timothy 3 as I read it to you and see if this describes the days we're living in, at least here in this culture. It says, but know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters. Are you guys checking these all off? Because check, check, 
proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, and having a form of godliness that's, but denying its power. Man, if you look at the news, you Google the news, you watch the news, or however you get your news, you can just see how all this is starting to play out in the culture. Our world's, world's falling apart, and it's falling prophetically into place. When we see all these things happen, we don't have to worry about the world spinning out of control. It's doing exactly what God said it was going to do. And it's speeding up towards the great tribulation daily, which means the rapture is coming soon. Now, I've been saying the same thing for 20 years. Man, the rapture's got to be close. My son always laughs at me. Uh, but it's, and we are getting closer. So every year that I say it, we are closer, right? Huh? So I'm not totally wrong. But when we see all these things happening, we have to realize that, yeah, you know what? We are definitely in the season of his return. We just don't know when. Now, all these things said, according to Jesus, this is not really an indicator of how close we are to his return. So what we need is a more reliable indicator of when he's going to return. Church, do you remember what Jesus' response was to the disciples' question? Tell us, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age in Matthew 24? Yeah, well, there's all kinds of stuff in Matthew 24, so I wasn't really being very kind to you. Um, but this is what I'm looking for. Um, Jesus responded in verse 6, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Because of Jesus' words in this passage, whenever there's rumor of a conflict, especially in the era of Israel, many people start to think, man, is this it? Like, are we, we're right on the, the, earth, the, the very edge of, like, the coming of the Lord. We see it as an end time sign. But if you read the last part of Matthew 24, verse 6, Jesus says, see that you are not alarmed. For this must take place, but the end is not yet. You know, we read the World War III. They always come up with that big, bold World War III is about to happen, or this coming conflict could spark World War III that wipes out all humanity. That headline stirs up fear in many people. But Jesus said to not be alarmed. The end is not yet. In the same way, Jesus spoke of false Christs, famines, earthquakes, persecution, apostasy, false prophets, warning that... All these things are the beginning of the birth pains. And boy, we're seeing all that stuff just happening more and more frequently and more intensely. And many of them this year being unprecedented. But all these things that Jesus pointed to as not necessarily being signs of the end times are precisely the things that most people look at as the sign of the end times. Jesus' point seems to be this, that there has always been false Christs. Famines, earthquakes, persecution, apostasy, false prophets, wars and rumors of wars. We've always had those things throughout our culture. So they're not necessarily reliable predictors for the end times. I do, however, believe that what we're seeing in the way of Ezekiel's Gog and Magog coalition forming gives us a sense of how close we might be to the rapture because this coming war is specifically prophesied to happen during the Great Tribulation period. I also believe that President Trump's declaration that Jerusalem is the undivided capital of Israel also gives us a sense of how close things are getting. And this upcoming proposal, this peace treaty that they are trying to work on and, and, and complete, um, is it the treaty that will be signed by an Antichrist? Maybe, maybe not. But all these things tell us that we are definitely in the season. But regardless of what, the sci what signs are going on around us, the mission Jesus has given us remains the same. And it just so happens that our mission is what Jesus says is a reliable predictor of the end times. So what is our mission, church? Has something to do with the gospel, just as a hint? Preach the gospel. Jesus said in Matthew 24, In this gospel, the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and he ends it with, and then the end will come. Whether you're a prophecy buff hitting the news feeds at 4 a.m. like me, I'm always up early just checking to see what's going on in the world. Or you're listening to your favorite prophecy teacher. Or, or maybe you're somebody who just shies away from prophecy altogether. You don't really want to, you don't get it. You don't really understand it. You just want to kind of ignore it. We all have the same mission in the end, and that is to what? Share the gospel. Jesus said the end will come when the gospel of the kingdom has been proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. 
I recently um, heard that the owner of his channel, anybody ever go on his channel? Anybody know about it? Brent. I guess, you're it. It's called his channel. Yeah. Basically, it's a whole bunch of different, most of them are Calvary Chapel uh, preachers, but they have other guys as well. Um, that you can go on, and they just have these incredible um, end time stuffs on there. There's all kinds of stuff, information, basically teaching of the Bible. But the owner of his channel, um, he basically said this, that he was incredibly amazed this Christmas season of the Muslim traffic going onto his site, Googling the birth of Jesus, or trying to find things about the birth of Jesus. With our current technology, the gospel is going out to the world in ways once unheard of, and the Holy Spirit's moving throughout the world, speaking to the lost. But what did Jesus mean when he said, and then the end will come? Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 11, verse 25. He says, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that the blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Who's a Gentile? If you're not a Jew, you're a... Okay, you guys got it. So basically what Paul is saying is here is there is some Gentile in the world who is the last one who's going to be saved. doesn't mean that every Gentile is going to get saved on the planet, but there is that last Gentile who, when he acknowledges Jesus Christ as his Savior, when he or she, whoever it is, that's when the fullness of the Gentiles will, will be complete. And what happens at that instant? We're going up, the rapture. Can you imagine you're the last person and you give your life to the Lord and instantly you're with them? That's, a, that's cool. So, in closing, church prophecy is not given to us to scare us. It's given to us to prepare us. And I hope you leave here today a little more prepared and not just scared. Because we don't have to be afraid. God's got this. But I want to speak to the person who might be here, or maybe they're listening online, probably more than likely, hopefully, who's wondering, like, they're kind of, this is all crazy to them, but they're also wondering, well, what is the gospel? What is the gospel? What do we call the gospel? It's the good news. It's the opposite of what? Bad news. So I'm going to share a little bit about the bad news first. Because without it, sometimes you don't really realize what the good news is. The bad news is this, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Amen? Not amen, but you understand? Um, which makes us separated from God with no hope of ever remedying that situation. We can't be good enough on our own. We can't earn it with good deeds. Our sin nature dooms us to an eternity in hell separated from God. That's just truth. It's in hell that man rightly pays the penalty of sin against a holy and righteous God. And this would be extremely bad news if there wasn't a way to fix this. But the good news is that God, by his power, provided the way for us to be redeemed, to be made right in his eyes by giving us his only begotten son, perfect and sinless, to be that one-time sacrifice for our sins. Jesus, born as a babe in Bethlehem, we just celebrated that. It was a great, great time lived a perfect and sinless life here on earth. He was beaten, scourged, crucified on a wooden cross, and punished by God for our sins. He willingly gave up his life on the cross that we might be saved. He was buried in a tomb, and on the third day rose again to life, just as he said he would. Church, he conquered death so that we who believe would not perish, but have everlasting life. We who believe by faith are forgiven and we're saved. Not by anything we've done, but by what Jesus Christ alone has done for us. So if there's somebody in this room, there's somebody listening online, maybe they're listening, I don't know, a month from now. If you're not saved, man, give your life to Christ. And if you're the last Gentile on the planet, man, you're going to be doing all of us a big favor, eh? All right? That's it. That's a wrap for me. I just want to end in prayer, and then I got a couple things I'll mention, and then you guys are free to enjoy this incredible sunshine. Father, we are so thankful for your word. Lord, I don't know how a person lives in this world without hope. And that hope comes through your son, and that hope comes through your word. Lord, thank you that you've given it to us. May we be those who search it daily. May we be those who realize that our mission that you commanded us to do is to proclaim the gospel, to tell people about the good news, to share it all around the world. 
Lord, we can just um, touch the people that we have access to. But I pray, Lord, we would just do it with boldness and do it with love and do it um, just because we want to share the truth of who you are and how great you are. So, Lord, bless our time now as we go and celebrate this new year that's coming. Lord, may everybody stay safe, and uh, may you bring them back in the new year. And again, Lord, just thank you for your son and all that you do and how you bless us. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.